come out in very tiny and big ways and weird ways and funny ways. And so that is what my thing is about. And it's called Seven Times I Came Out. <laughs> One, I'm young. I have a boyfriend, as is the fashion. We like each other all right, but there is always something missing, always something wrong. He says that we're puzzle pieces. I'd say that one of us is soggy from being left out in the rain or put in a toddler's mouth. He laughs, but I'm serious. I say we should go to a strip club. He says he's worried I'll fall in love with one of the strippers. I laugh, but he's serious. And on it goes. We meet his friends for someone's birthday party at a bar. The bartender is gorgeous. She's tall and fiery and wearing a corset that is doing all of us a kindness. I'm wearing a gin and tonic when the birthday bro plants himself next to me at the bar. She's hot, he says. She is, I agree. You should make out with her, he says. I think she'd like that. Well, I'm pretty sure my boyfriend wouldn't. Nah, he'd like it for sure, especially if you touch that rap of hers. You're gross, I say. <laughs> Yo, it's not gross to watch women make out for you, he says. I'm by. It wouldn't be for you guys. It would be for me, and I'd like it a lot more than this. Two, I'm at my parents' house for the night. My mom's at the gym, dad's watching HBO Full Metal Jacket turn to bring it on, which I'm fairly sure he has no interest in, but my dad's a very suffer through it kind of TV viewer. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you guys all have dads like that. <laughs> too lazy to change the channel, but not too lazy to keep his mouth shut. Because of this particular viewing style, he's probably seen this movie a few times, but he's also a dozer, so he doesn't really remember. Of course, Bring It On is one of my top ten teen movies. I have much of it memorized. Sure, Kirsten does as a babe, but I'm all about Elijah Dushku. When she flips off the observing cheerleaders while wiping the ink-drawn tattoo off her arm, I die a little. She's my future wife, I say. My dad looks over his glasses at me for a second before sighing. Oh, he says, I forgot you were that way. <laughs> Maury, there's a teenage boy by himself. 
Next to him is a pair of crutches, but he doesn't seem particularly distressed. They call my name and I stand slowly. My knees have always been a bit of a shit show. Congenital issues that seem basically unidentifiable have plagued me since childhood. A few weeks ago, they completely stopped working. I'm hobbling and in pain and nearly defeated. The radiologist, an older woman who smells vaguely of roses, directs me to the wall, showing me where she'll have me stand. Is there any chance you're pregnant, she says? No, I say. You know, she looks at me like she's about to confide in me some great secret. The only true way to prevent pregnancy is abstinence. She gives me a slight nod. The woman in the booth behind her rolls her eyes almost into her hijab. I don't know what it is about me that suggests I'm unsure how to prevent pregnancy, but I had this conversation with my dentist and an ER nurse as well. <laughs> restaurant that's centered in the gay scene. It's a sappy dinner that fills me with drinks and joy. On our way out, I realize it's ladies' night at the ancillary space, and there's a woman standing at the bar who I've seen multiple times on the apps. <laughs> I've always thought she was cute, and now here she is, the vision before me. My friend insists I should talk to her while he waits outside. At the bar, I order my fourth gin and tonic, which is too many gin and tonics. My game plan is strong continued eye contact until she caves and asks me to move in with her. <laughs> I swallow my drink and my dreams in three large gulps and stumble out of the bar. <laughs> the night devolves from there, and it's not long till I'm making out with a bouncer at a bar up the street. <laughs> his name is Bartholomew, or Cuthbertson, something regal. He plays the saxophone or the trumpet, something jazzy. We talk about our locks and Los Angeles, and every time we kiss, I say I never do this into his mouth. But four gin and tonics are convincing, and that woman hurt my spirit. The next day, Bartholomew Cuthbert's and Thaddeus III text me many nice things. <laughs> You're sweet, I write, but I don't do this. You said that last night, but you acted differently. I'm gay, I text. Well, not too gay to make out with me. I want to get to know you. Okay, well, I'm queer, I say. What does that mean? I feel his exasperation through the screen. It means I'm bisexual but homo-romantic. The fuck, he says? <laughs> Our childhoods were full of exploring nature, fishing, and play. 
When the hormones kicked in, well, that's when things got complicated. <laughs> it started innocently enough, boys would be boys after all. Sharing the bed during sleepovers, our bodies inch closer to one another. The gravity of the situation was too much for either of us, and then finally we met and bang. <laughs> These sleepovers became more frequent, and electricity was palpable. Like licking a battery that ran shot through me when I would see his parents' headlights coming to drop him off. We were young, we were so excited, and the fear of hell couldn't stop us. And it didn't have to, because we had our own holy loophole. We're only experimenting. People do this and it doesn't mean anything. This isn't gay. <laughs> that was the script we told ourselves. See, John may have been my first hookup, but he was my first kiss. To guys discovering their bodies like combos is just a phase. But if we make it out, then we are deaf homos when burning a lake of fire. My dark secret in this was pretty obvious. I wanted to dive up and head first into that lake to the men that I could kiss him. The strange torment lasted through for years, through middle school and into high school. We grew apart socially. He got wrapped up in track and football, and I was growing up arts and sciences. We still thought on time for one another. But each time I just like look at his lips and wonder what would it be like to press mine against his. With time, the script grew hollow. We weren't friends anymore and soon not lovers either. I was so hurt. I had lost my friend and was just left with the realization that I was queer and didn't know how to handle it or hide it. I was depressed by it. I was still in denial of it all. By this point, I can drive. I have a little more freedom. And the only gay role models I had at the time were the original Bad Five and Bowen Grace. <laughs> I didn't connect with anything queer yet because every variation of gay I'd seen just didn't fit for me. But then, my hometown had a film festival. It was a small screen. I was there by myself and there was a tiny audience. Waiting in the lobby, I saw a man walk inside who was maybe just 30. Dark eyes with long lashes, a bright smile. And it was Jack. He saw some people he knew and shouting at them. Those eyes found mine. So, I did what any other high school closet case would do. Hi. <laughs> I went to the theater and waited for the screen. But who was that I kept wondering? I didn't have to wait long. He walked in, saw me, walked down the empty row and asked, May I sit here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
welcome John Boucher. Exactly as I imagined she would. Her demeanor was cold and business like as she questioned me. Was I sure? Had I ever been with a woman? Why not give it a shot? <laughs> Why it's a phase? And then she said, I think Joan made you this way by indulging you. Who's Joan? I asked. You remember Joan, your nursery school teacher. <laughs> I shook my head. No makeup, frosted hair, more cool on tippy sandals. She really liked you. I laughed. My nursery school te teacher did not make me gay by allowing me to play dress up. I already knew I was gay. How? How did you know that? I don't know. I just knew. Besides, mommy. We're talking about being gay now. She winced a little when I called her mommy. She hates that name. <laughs> I had the same feeling it's the feeling of being a small, innocuous animal holding its breath so the beast doesn't notice you, so it can scurry through the jungle and into the clearing alive. And then she asked the question I was ready. Do you have AIDS? I swallowed, closed my eyes, and said, yes, I'm HIV positive. Tell me everything, John, blow by blow. Tell me how you got this AIDS thing. 
<laughs> I taught my testicles to send back into my body. <laughs> I spoke in a deliberate monotone and answered all her questions. Clinically, I told my mother how I thought I'd zero convert. I picked up a guy in the steam room at the gym, I said. That's not why I paid for that gym membership. <laughs> <laughs> I know that, but I thought I could do both. <laughs>
wanted a hysterectomy and pickled kumquat skin. Assimilation is internalized hatred and, black, and the black crows of self erasure. Superstition allows for closure, clarity, and bridges distance. Small strategies about the self come easy with acute pain. An ending of a poem makes transformation seem possible. A riddle is inertia's plaything, prolonging death. Dear climax, if I were a boy, I could easily choose to reject reproduction. Lineage is a reminder of its own risk. Only if you control the dice, since forgiveness is a motionless act of gypsum light, and mourning is why it is almost impossible to upset yourself from a collective fate. Without familiarity with my assigned gender, I'm less. My anxiety is a yard sale of dead people stuff. <laughs> Dear Climax, death is the way I tap the ridges on our teeth with my fingernails, bring veins of vertical smoky quartz in damp continents. Death is the way I tap the sides of Tupperware since I was a fat kid. We only get better when we acknowledge our limits and shortcomings. <coughs> Death is how durable she is. Is she enough to keep around? Toxic cycles to birth fears. The shock of first bites are sweeter than the tips of peppers. I have an irrational fear that I'm going to go blind mid-fucking. <laughs> Death is durable enough to reuse yogi self-confidence since to supplement health extends and replaces. The truth is, I'm just looking for a spot in your body to fail in, to hide in. Clarity is not sudden. It catapults from primal emotions and it holds them. In your absence, I turn into a gargoyle. Frozen peppercorns and birds die when they defecate on me. Death isn't. Is it death? Just another climax, dear. How to pivot when you're paralyzed. There's a giant temple on Hazard and New Hope Street with blue reptiles and green maze and skeletons. Keepers of time, how long do you have to sit there with the pain before you try to fix it? It's hard to admit that my role in your life is up for grabs. In the capacity of as being a slow careening full of sweat and spit. Wolf knocks are not for the living, they are for fallen warriors. You won't know that you're in the pivotal moments until you're no longer in them. Aubergine, aubergine. Truth is a social contract. Contract. If it's not visceral, it's not satisfying. Moss head war bonnets are like exposed, exposed frost bit earlobes. Intentional cognitive dissonance is clarity with a mask on. Once, you were able to draw circles around the pain with an elongated ooh sound. Sadness tinged with liberation is the best kind of closure. I'm not vulnerable. I'm right and receptive. A poem works not by referring to what happens on the outside world, but by calling it into play. I want to exist in a space of friction of excitement where there are no monsters nor martyrs, just orange patchwork, graves of fireflies in the gravity of urine.
Are you asking accident? My other brother, my other brother, accident. <laughs> and there are a lot of stories in most cases that involve someone's twin, a deceitful villain, or someone just living in Toko. <laughs> <laughs> the hero and the heroine always found true love to be stronger than anything. But what about me or people like me? I'm from the biggest city in the world, Mexico City. Unfortunately, there is a lot of machismo. And it always bothered me because guys who have like multiple baby mamas or who are cheating with multiple women, or who just belittle women by putting them in their place, they're, they're considered manly and macho. I remember my father pointing at the gay waiter and saying, look at that, puto, maricón, puñal, coto. All these words that meant gay as an animal that less than human. And we going to church, we were Catholic, just sitting there looking at the massive cross up on that altar and knowing what I knew about myself and just praying, please God, not me. Mm -hmm. We moved to the United States, then everything changed when I met men. We went on a date at Santa Monica Pier. Only I didn't know it was a date because he said, let's hang out. <laughs> <laughs> I stood there in shocks when he said, I want to date you. When arriving to the United States, one of the first things I was told was not to trust anyone, not even my own shadow just for legal status, which is, which is why, which is why when I introduced myself first uh, with men, I didn't even introduce myself with my real name. Okay. And I said to myself, what is the quickest way to get rid of a guy? You tell him the truth about yourself. <laughs> so then I go, you don't want to date me. He frowns and asks me, why not? Well, for starters, the name I gave you earlier is fake. I take a ID and I show him. These glasses I'm wearing are fake too. And I still took off my glasses. <laughs> These shoes have a three inch insole, so I'm not 5'9. <laughs> <laughs> and I took off the shoes I was wearing, which I had on a website called homemadeshoes.com. <laughs> and I shot them onto the sand. So, do you still want to date me? He gets up takes my hand and kisses me. I felt like I was being seen for the first time. I told him everything, like word vomit, from my dad walking out of my mom and my other brothers, no bills paid, having to give up school so I could work, how I've been fired from my job for being illegal, and I, I had to work any job I could find working under the table for well below minimum wage, working up to 16 hour shifts just to get by. You're so strong, and I really admire that from you, he said. It felt kind of perfect, like the stars had aligned, like after all these years of hardship and suffering had led me up to meeting him, a person who understood me and who I understood, because it turned out we were both Mexicans and we were both DACA recipients. To those who don't know, it's a program that allows people like me to stay in the country protected from ICE because we came to the U.S. as children. I thought we could t trust each other, we could keep each other safe, I introduced him to my mom and my brothers, and they all thought he was a good friend. <laughs> We've been dating for almost two years now. We were watching RuPaul's Drag Race, <laughs> and we had to do laundry, so we went. We were there holding clothes in the mountain, and this task just seemed much better with them, and I'm just there holding these t-shirts when I look over, and I just, I knew. These were the t-shirts I wanted to hold for the rest of my life. I decided I was going to propose, and I was going to get married. I'd made the love of my life, and everyone, everything was going to go perfect, just like a happy ending in a telenovela. <laughs> and then came the worry, because I had to come out of my family. No way I was going to get married without them in my wedding. The first one to come out were my little brothers, and that was easy, because it was an easy thing to tell them, and an easy thing for them to understand, because they weren't religious, like the adults. So the big problem here was my mom. She had heart problems, and I didn't want to upset her and get more sick. I was trying to work up the courage when I got a text from men. I wanted to talk about something. I'm sure what's up, I replied. Lately, I've been, I haven't been all there in my head, and I don't know if I should tell you over text. You can call me. 
Suddenly the place seemed to have dropped in temperature and I was shivering. I've been thinking about our relationship lately, he started. What about our relationship? I asked. You have your responsibilities and I need to be with somebody. His voice trailed off. And I wondered what did he mean he needed to be with somebody? Like I thought he was the, I was the one he loved. I still care for you, he says. But I knew care is the same as love. I've been thinking about this for the past month ever since Trump came into power. And I broke out, what? I, I refused to believe it. It couldn't be when just days ago he had just said how much he loved me and missed me, and he felt like talking to a completely different person. The argument that he was breaking up with me for my own good turned out the cheap excuse. We didn't speak for a month. I still had some of his belongings, and I went to his house. I knocked. The door, his brother answered. He's upstairs. Do you want me to get him? He asked. I want her to say no. I want her to say yes, but the word does slouch in my throat. I said no instead. I told him to get him his belongings for me. Then as he's walking me out, I see him walking out the garage, taking out the trash. There's about 10 feet distance between us. We make eye contact, and I feel the world vanish before my feet. He takes, us, he takes out his cell phone and just looks down and walks away. Mm. A couple days after that, my cell phone rings. It was an unknown number. I answered the phone and this male voice seeps through. Stop stalking my boyfriend, the shrill voice hisses. <laughs> there was a long pause on my end until I say, what? The voice said, you know he told me all about you. He pitied you. And I could hear the satisfaction in his voice. Sweetie, before he even broke up with you, he was sick and tired of you. Plus, I can give him something you never could. And I was so angry, and I just said, and what would that be? Herpes? <laughs> <laughs> There's a tent coming for the month, says Shirley, the office manager, her voice pinched like a tight shirt collar, permed ashy hair tight as her pursed lips when she's not speaking. Mr. Ashford's nephew starts first thing tomorrow. Make him feel welcome and people be on time. <laughs> and with a perfect pivot, cap, gun, heel, click, 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 clicks, ricochet off the fluorescent lights and receive it. <laughs> I 
exaggerated eye roll, look at Glenn. His shoulder-length hair slipped back and stuck under his collar, another one of Shirley's rules. Corporate says no male employee's hair can go below the shirt collar. Glenn's lips are pursed the gay way, slightly to the right, under an arched eyebrow. <laughs> going to send his nephew all the way from Connecticut to Los Angeles for a four-week internship? It doesn't make sense to me. So the next day, I'm not on time. I'm early. I'm curious. And I am rearranging my reinsurance files on my desk when Glenn turns the corner, speed-talking the tour, his hands fluttering like he's cutting a dress pattern, one with pleats. <laughs> Standing right next to him is this Botticelli boy. Mm -hmm. Long, wavy brown hair shines down to his shoulders. His eyes sparkle like the diamond earring in his left ear. And I wonder, are his cheeks always the color of faded pink bubblegum? <laughs> <laughs> I wonder where his tan line stops. <laughs> at his arms because he's on a yacht, or at his waist because he's playing sports, or not at all, just because I'm wondering. <laughs> <laughs> is, he, is he a junior or a third or, or one of those boys that's like, it's Christopher, not Chris, David, not Dave. <laughs> and all of a sudden, Glenn taps my desk. Hello, are you in there? <laughs> this is Rob. A hand extends out, this beautifully carved wooden beaded bracelet that peeks out from underneath his shirt cuff. It's with two Bs. My aunt decided to drop the IE from Robbie. She said that that would be a good way for me to slide into rooms a little off center, whatever that means. <laughs> what do you think? Well, I think <clears throat> and all of a sudden Glenn is clearing his throat. His lips are for Shirley style. <laughs> I think you're going to have a great time here and I'm going to go back to work now. And Rob shrugs this and smiles a smile that seems a little off center before he's dragged off into the forest with Glenn. <laughs> Later at the coffee machine, Glenn corners me and says, so, he has a girlfriend. That's who gave him the bracelet. The bracelet. Did you see the bracelet? I'm just telling you this in case you saw the bracelet. I have no idea what the time I'm about. <laughs> For the rest of that week, I look up and I look over. And I make eye contact. And I look away. And I look back and watch him blush. Return to smile. Return to work. Repeat. <laughs> <laughs> the second week, I look over just in time to see Shirley cap tap heel over to his desk and announce that he. His uncle has called every day, and she has given him an update that everything is going just fine. Yes? <laughs> and I look away, and I, I look back just in time to see Glenn drop a big stack of crooked folders on his desk. Week three, I, I look up and I look over and I try to make eye contact, but <laughs> Rob's chair seems lower, and his back is kind of bent over, and defeats, and his bubblegum pink cheeks looks like a leftover from a previous adventure. And then that Friday, Glenn announces that he is going to Gay Pride that weekend, as if everybody in the office is gay and is available and wants to go. Well, I'm going. Well, no, I'm not. I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, I've been before. I didn't love it. I mean, dykes on bikes and leathermen and big parade floats. It's, you know, I don't know. I, I should go, but I... I really hate the clicky boys, of, the of little packs of cute boys that push their way past me, not looking at me. I mean, do I have to relive high school being an outcast all over again? <laughs> but Sunday morning, I am early. I am outside of the greenery where Glenn said he would be, and I am optimistic. I, I scan the crowd. I'm looking at people. I try to ignore the shirtless guys on top of the mother load who are already drunk on 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning. And all of a sudden, there's a light tap on my shoulder. And I turn around and it's Rob. 
He's wearing a Go-Go's t-shirt and white jean shorts and black and white bands and a really, really nervous smile. Hi. Mm -hmm. Hey, you're here? Rob's feet shuffle uncertainty. He fur furtively glances over, past through and around me. Is Glenn here? And I shake my head now. Rob's feet try to walk away. His hummingbird eyes die all, dart all over the place except at me. I, I took a chance, he says. I, I, made a, I made a wish on my bracelet. Oh, the one that your girlfriend gave you? Yeah, I mean, no. I mean, she's not my girlfriend. We just let people think that. I mean, no. Um, I'm, 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 I'm not. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm gay. And at that moment in time, he is suddenly gravity free. He is floating above the sidewalk in space, boundless and open. He motions to Boy's Town behind him, and his hummingbird eyes finally land on me. I leave the day after tomorrow. Be my day, please. Mm -hmm. I become a crepe paper flower on a parade float. <laughs> <laughs> I take his hand and we head into the crowd. Now, the parade was different for me this time. I mean, there were AIDS and ARC organizations and scores of red ribbons being worn by parents and, and bank workers. There, there were church members filling in the spaces between the floats with dancing boys. There's something for everybody, Rob says, his voice just filled with wonder. And at that moment in time, a nun on roller skates passes by and hands us condoms. <laughs> During the parade, Rob tells me a story. His, his really overly strict dad's relentless pushing, he says, they don't know. And his mom's pill-filled absence says, I can't tell them. And his favorite aunt is in the story of every story he tells. She's like a dream catcher protecting him. I live in a big stone house behind a tall iron fence, and mostly I am just all alone. This is at the after of the parade. There are tens and thousands of people overflowing Santa Monica Boulevard like a, a river of living lava pouring toward the festival gates. And I grab him and I turn him around and I hold him and I say, you see this? This is your tribe. You are not alone. Inside the festival, we're everywhere. We learned the country western dance and the echoey gymnasium. It's all stuffy. We eat ice cream cones that we bought from the lesbians that had the step band that stuck, sat in the middle of the quad. We wandered through all those booths filled with too much rainbow everything, coffee cups and pendants and t-shirts and chalk straps. We watched the drag queens do stand up and then we listened to Romanovsky and Phillips play a concert to the crowd as the day leaned toward the sunset. And the day fell away and became that good part of the date. When you try to stretch it out and make it last, you want to keep it going. So arm in arm, we walk slowly toward the exit, together alone in a crowd of people, and someone whoops and yells my name. It's Glenn. <laughs> He's in suspenders and hot pants. <laughs> <laughs> He's heading our way. His outstretched hands are looking for words. You do? Oh, please. <laughs> over and gives us a big sloshy embrace and says, I won't tell, I promise. <laughs> and then all of a sudden he extends his arms open like this and says, isn't this amazing? And he disappears into the crowd. <laughs> Rob laughs and grabs me and holds me tight and says, he's probably not going to remember this, but I will never forget this day. <laughs> and on the boulevard we watch others start making their way home. So, You live alone? Usually. <laughs> Usually? <coughs> Not tonight. So the next day, as we enter the elevator going to work, Rob says, we have to play it cool upstairs, so I'll say goodbye now. And as the elevator doors close, he grabs me and kisses me really deep, and I grind into him and hold tight, vaguely aware of the sliding sound. We break apart and find that the doors have reopened because we didn't push the elevator. <laughs> <laughs> There's a crowd of people standing there waiting to get on the elevator and front and center is Shirley. <laughs> like he'll tap it in arms, lips, person. She says, this is unbelievable. I was just 
on the phone with your uncle last Friday, and he said it wasn't even his idea to send you out here. It was your aunt's idea. She's going to be crushed. Crushed. <laughs> Rob entwines his fingers with mine and said, Aunt Dot, send me out here? Oh, I can't wait to tell her about my trip. He reached up and kissed me. <laughs> See, an aunt who had a keen eye and an inkling <laughs> for her shy nephew took, who took a chance and, and went to a pride festival hoping for a meeting that turned into a coming out, that turned into a perfect day, that became a memory that is now part of our shared history. Mm -hmm. Happy pride. <laughs> Thank you. 